increasingly. Through selective breeding, the differences between rulers and ruled will increase until they are almost different species. That's what mathematician Bertrand Russell said, capturing the predatory dominance behind the spirit of the eugenics. The vision was to transcend man. What nature does slowly, humans could do swiftly through genetics. Sir Francis Galton, first cousin of Charles Darwin, coined the term eugenics and through the Royal Society in London brought it to prominence. Powerful and wealthy industrialists who'd concentrated huge monopolies at the height of the Industrial Revolution, seized upon the elitist treatise fueling an international movement for eugenics as a means of keeping the masses of humanity under their yoke. Human labor lost value under the rise of technology. Life had become cheap as an emerging scientific dictatorship made man a mere cog in a vast machine. Eugenics became more than just a policy to guide reproduction wisely. It evolved into many branches of control under state power. From eugenic sterilization laws in the United States and Britain, to the extermination policies of the Nazis and other dictators, to controls on the use of resources, carbon taxes, and the number of children families can have. The New World Order emerged from the shadows, and the state religion of population control became an all-out war against the individual and family. Good evening. I'm Aaron Dykes, and this is another InfoWars special report. Tonight, we're going to go in-depth and look into the eugenics movement and what it means for our modern society and how we came to be mere pets in this system which seeks total control under the New World Order. What is eugenics? It's an elitist philosophy for a transhuman man which leaves behind the husk of the underclass. It's a way to wipe out the regular man and devalue human labor. We've reduced ourselves to being nothing more than inventory in a complex system under this nation and under this global treaty. There really is population control in the literal sense going on on this planet. And we're tagged, traced, and numbered. Everyone knows about the complications, the risks, and the horrifying nightmares produced by RFID, tracking technology, what will happen if we have a chip under us. Uh, facial scans, iris scans, recognition. Where did that all come about? To find out, we have to go back to the roots of the modern eugenics system. Back in 1883, when Sir Francis Galton, cousin of Charles Darwin, Darwin, coined eugenics and made it a movement that would transform our modern society, especially in the Western world. Francis Galton uh, developed the first system of biometrics, including finger fingerprints for criminal identification. He also developed uh, supposed theories for racial hygiene, for improvement, for supposed positive eugenics, where the elites could breed and expect to increase their fold. Instead, his family, the Huxleys and the others who bred with him, uh, disintegrated into halfway intelligent and halfway just disturbed human beings with lots of problems. But the system he set up emerged not only in the UK where he was part of the Royal Society of London, but also in the US at the Eugenics Record Office at Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory on the East Coast, where in the early 1900s, some of the most wealthy industrialists, including the Carnegie family, the Harrimans and the Rockefellers, set up a centralized records office where they sent field workers out to talk to ordinary people to collect data, height, sex, history, number of people in the family, bloodlines, racial information, and centralize it all, hair samples, try to analyze it and try to figure out who was worth sterilizing and leaving behind in this world and who was worth breeding to increase the numbers of supposedly good humans. The use of IBM developed Hollerith punch cards, uh, started being used in 1890 for the first U.S. Census using modern scientific technology. This punch card allowed them to classify all these vital statistics and use the data to selectively analyze the population they were trying to control. That technology was further used by the eugenicist clique 
at Cold Springs Harbor for what was known as the Jamaican race mixing study, where in 1927, uh, they studied the supposed benefits, risks, and uh, tendencies of race mixing between, generally speaking, Negro and white populations and the so-called mulatto populations, all in Jamaica. That technology soon transferred over to Nazi Germany. These eugenic sterilization laws were not unique to Nazi Germany, though. The United States had these laws in more than 27 U.S. states, I believe 33 all told, set up starting in the early 1920s, but they didn't end until the late 70s and even early 80s, all disgracefully targeting the autonomy of the family and the individual, challenging the right to reproduce and trying to bring in this eugenics world society. For a little more perspective on how bureaucracy became so tyrannical, let's look at the quote from Carol Quigley, historian for the elite and author of Tragedy and Hope. He said that the modern man, the 20th century supposedly democratic man, will in general have his freedom and choice controlled within very narrow alternatives by the fact that he will be numbered from birth and followed as a number through his educational training, through his required military and other public service, through his tax contributions, through his health and medical requirements, and his final retirement and death benefits. Carol Quigley warned us, or was simply observing, that we are a number from birth to death under this eugenics New World Order sensor, uh, system, which is a centralized control system uh, using the modern industrial technology. How did this become so dangerous? Well, it was the elites, uh, including those who were already dominant and those who became dominant at the height of the Industrial Revolution, who established these super monopolies, which we know the Rockefeller Oil Monopoly, the Carnegie Steel Monopoly, and the Harriman Railroad Monopoly, very emblematic of that. They paired up with the rising collectivist models, not only socialism and communism, but fascism, Nazism, which is National Socialism, and also the kind of New Deal set up under the FDR system and other similar systems. We continue in one version or another of that system today. We have our Social Security numbers and all the other things just mentioned by Carol Quigley. So we have babies' blood and databases. We have the Human Genome Project, uh, which tries to analyze our racial data and, and draw conclusions and supposedly provide a more promising future. But what else are they using that for? And why does this collective model become so psychopathic? Let's look at a naked statement from George Bernard Shaw, a leading Fabian socialist who led the promise of socialism, uh, which may sound like a good idea, they're gonna take care of you, but look at that logo behind him. That's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He wasn't talking about a friendly socialism. He was talking about how under socialism, you would not be allowed to be poor. You would be forcibly fed, clothed, lodged, taught, and employed whether you liked it or not. But if it were discovered that you had not the character and industry enough to be worth all this trouble, you might be possibly executed in a kindly manner. But whilst you were permitted to live, you would have to live well. But however you lived, you would be a cog of the state, servile to this centralized system. Now, today we have the post-World War II United Nations system, which itself has branches, UNESCO, the branch for education, science, and culture, headed by eugenicist Julian Huxley, who's from that original uh, eugenics family, which included the Darwins, the Galtons, and uh, T.H. Huxley, who was the elder grandfather of the author, Aldo Huxley and Julian Huxley, the first head of UNESCO, also a transhumanist. You also have the United Nations Population Fund, uh, which makes gross characterizations and recommendations, especially in developing and third world countries. You also have mechanisms like the World Bank and the IMF, now in the present day, using loan availability to supposedly improve and develop these countries as a condition to meet population reduction goals. Yes, there are population reduction goals, and the deep secret is that there's a global population database apparatus in use, not necessarily centralized in one location or another, but continued through the philosophy of these eugenicists and the collectivists used today in our bureaucratic systems, but also used to analyze our 
supposed racial data and our supposed worth as human beings. We're looking now at a chart of the top foundations who were giving to population control causes in the year 2000. You can see that in the case of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, hundreds of millions of dollars a year are going to causes, including but certainly not limited to abortion. You also have other top technocrats like the David and Lucille Packard Foundation of Hewlett Packard, uh, the other computer company, also giving hundreds of millions of dollars. The Ford Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, the other half of HP, the Rockefeller Foundation, MacArthur, the Ted Turner Foundation, and the George Soros Open Society Institute, all contributing to overt and covert population control causes, especially in the developing and third world. Now let's take an even closer look at the Rockefeller Foundation, a prime example in the modern day eugenics movements. They were of course very powerful industrial family, of course allied with even bigger families like the Rothschilds. And they learned that their oil empire was hated, especially in America in the early parts of the 20th century. They were funding the birth control movement headed by Margaret Sanger. They were also funding the Nazi Germany Kaiser Wilhelm Institute which was a huge vehicle for the entire Western European eugenics movement. They were further funding social engineering through many of the universities, including Caltech University in California, where they sought to use the early genetics, even before they discovered the full potential and exact mechanism of DNA, at least officially. Uh, and they were using some of the most famous scientists in the world to pursue research and development towards the biochemical engineering of man to remake him into a compliant and willing servant of the state. They were literally using the emerging genetics and DNA information, what they knew about breeding in the genome to produce the sort of citizens they wanted in what was already becoming the post-industrial world. You see, after the rise of machinery and centralized technology, the modern state, human labor lost its premium. It wasn't worth as much. And you look at where we are today in the 21st century with everything robots and nanotechnology and the sort of Ray Kurzweil vision of the future promises. And you can see that human beings as we know them, especially the masses, are not considered to be worth any more than the papers on this desk. They're just scenery, uh, something to be kept if a good socialist government wants to keep after them or to be just ruthlessly exterminated under this eugenic system. So the Rockefellers have been part of that and even after the war they used the environmentalism vehicles, the carbon tax vehicles, and especially the vaccines and genetically modified food vehicles to target humanity humanity from the perspective of his biosphere and from the perspective of within his and her own body. It's disgusting, ladies and gentlemen, but we could see that this global apparatus, which is tracking the population and seeking to control it, has been all over the world in an organized manner. So right now we're going to go to a clip showing you how the family planning vehicle, which sounds quite innocuous, uh, contraception, kind of uh, somewhat reasonable choices and reproduction, became a vehicle of tyranny. Let's go to that clip. And since the war, industrialists have been taking a deep interest in fertility control. As a part of industry-sponsored programs, health and welfare specialists go to workers' homes. Gradually, these programs break down shyness until at neighborhood meetings, birth control instruction begins. The government discusses it openly in magazines, newspapers, and films. Aided by interested industrialists, by a wise government, and by their own educated choices, they are deciding to keep families small. This is one of the few rural-based family planning programs in the state of Madras. Using posters and other aids, Padma describes the problem in personal terms. Family planning may be the key to solving India's food problem. Fewer children mean more money, which means more food, better clothes, and education, even more love. China is now conducting an intensive family planning campaign. Parents should have only two children, with a recommended spacing of four years. 
propaganda work is necessary to counteract the pressures from grandparents to have more children. In China, family planning is not only a personal matter, but a national concern. Messages are broadcast over radio and the ever-present loudspeaker. This midwife keeps records for every family in the brigade, indicating which method of contraception is being used. Here, she explains a record book for IUD insertions. Barefoot Dr. Xiao Xu delivers a once-a-month birth control pill that is being tested on her commune near Shanghai. The factory's barefoot doctors keep track of the women's menstrual cycles and deliver birth control pills at the proper time. Ladies and gentlemen, you just saw clips from several different countries, China, India, Japan, all as part of this global family planning and Planned Parenthood movement. Now, there's the abortion component, which is, of course, extremely controversial, and there's the whole left and right and pro-choice and pro-life movement contained within that. And then there's the mostly less controversial contraceptives, uh, so-called spacing of children issues. That, none of that is the direct issue. The real issue is that these industrialists have taken the official overt United Nations UNESCO vehicle and inputted their personal uh, agenda into it. You see, the Rockefellers had the Population Council started in the mid-50s by John D. Rockefeller III, brother to David Rockefeller and Nelson Rockefeller, the former vice president. And that, fam uh, that Population Council spent hundreds of millions, if not billions, every year in all these countries working together with those other industrial foundations, those extremely generous technocrat foundations with so much money, all attempting to drive down the reproduction rate through propaganda and centralized control of an authoritarian government? Did you see the clip where they make home visits in every country? Did you see how China, which became the nightmare one-child authoritarian state, started off on kind of small population control, only two children? It's only suggested. You only have uh, contraceptives and, and other family planning materials. There's nothing forced except that there's local, state, and national health officials coming to check up on you, coming to make sure you fit in. So I want to show you another clip, which is uh, of Taiwan and its particular family planning case study. Uh, it parallels directly with this UNESCO document, which came out in 1973, Mass Media Family Planning and Development. You just saw in the other clip how they admit they're using propaganda centralized at the state control to implement and pressure the population to adopt contraceptives, uh, abortion, sterilizations, and other means of keeping down the population. Now, when countries like China get out of control, you have to also look at countries like India, which were sold on the soft approach, but then all these abuses happened afterwards. There were compulsory sterilization. There were mothers who were not informed that they were getting sterilized. There were camps where they took women and sterilized them in mass in India. There were other abuses in countries like Peru, Indonesia, Mexico, where social workers and eugenicists had targets for the number of people they were supposed to sterilize per month or per year, and they received cash rewards or little medals to coerce and lie to the masses, the people, the indigenous populations, and the uneducated, illiterate mothers, and to sterilize them and end their line forever. Let's go to that clip now and see what the soft approach looks like. But don't forget what the tyranny looks like too. Again, family planning by the Population Council, Rockefeller created and sponsored. Mr. S. M. Keeney, who has helped with the development of IUD programs in Taiwan, Turkey, Korea, India, Pakistan, Philippines, and Thailand. The application of the widely publicized Taichung Project to the island-wide family planning program. The neighborhoods were divided into areas where personal contact was made with the wives and both husbands and wives. After the training, Mrs. Lin is ready to start work. Her first stop is at the township registration office. Here she collects the names and addresses of all the married women, 20 to 39, no, with say. three or more children, one being a son. She plans to see all the married women with at least three children and one being a son. 
For each case responding, a coupon is filled out and sent to the Population Study Center for evaluation. The coupons are hand tabulated. Such factors as age, education, number of children who referred the case, and location are tabulated. The Population Study Center conducts an island-wide fertility survey, a follow-up sample of loop acceptors and coupon holders, and other studies which evaluate the national program. So again, you saw where they're taking records and tabulating them into centralized population databases, all coordinated from the wealthiest elite foundations and the very computer companies which developed a lot of this software. So who's running the centralized global population center and what happens when the birth rate doesn't go down fast enough? Let's look at some of the proposals brought up in EcoScience, the 1977 nightmare document by current White House czar John P. Holdren and his cohort Paul Ehrlich of the Population Bomb. He spoke about how the law regulates that other highly personal matters, for example, having more than one spouse at a time isn't allowed. Why should the law also not be able to prevent a person from having more than two children? The development of a long-term sterilizing capsule that could be implanted under the skin and removed when pregnancy is desired opens additional possibilities for coercive fertility control. The capsule could be implanted at puberty and might be removable with official permission for a limited number of births. We're talking about life under a global system where indeed it has been concluded that compulsory population control laws, even including laws requiring compulsory abortion, could be sustained even under the United States Constitution if the population crisis became sufficiently severe to endanger the society. Martial law under an emergency. That's what these people are writing about. And this system is absolutely authoritarian in its bent. Now the Rockefeller Foundation and other major funds developed the Norplant implant, which would do just what this quote described, prevent people from being able to reproduce without government authority. Now there's also something even more wicked developed by the Population Council, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, all backed by the Rockefeller family. Starting in 1968, they looked at how to produce vaccines for male and then also female infertility. Then by 1988, they had direct proposals they were funding, including the study of a sperm immobilizing factor found in human serum, research on human anti-sperm antibodies, and the development of an anti-fertility vaccine. They also funded research on a potential contraceptive vaccine based on beta HCG synthesized in bacteria. And then by 1997, they had a working model I've got it right here, fertility regulating and Im immunotherapeutic vaccines reaching human stage trials. These are vaccines which when a woman is pregnant will prompt an immuno response similar to if they had tetanus or numerous other diseases and abort the, homo the hormonal pregnancy response and prevent the baby from coming to term. That is what we have on the field even as the Rockefeller Foundation continues to fund vaccine and genetically modified foods. Eugenics has been a long way through the overt eugenics movements of the earlier part of the 20th century, whereas in the post part, the after World War II phase was far more covert. And you can see already where they're using vaccines, food, sterilants and water and other bizarre proposals to begin to literally control the population as well as holding it hostage to supposed environmental factors. Then there's where eugenics gets into foreign policy. Starting under the LBJ administration, skull and bones and Bush brother under the skin, William Draper uh, began advising LBJ on the need for the USAID uh, agency which could provide birth control in the third world for overpopulated countries. That led directly into the Nixon phase where you had Henry Kissinger proposing the use of food as a weapon and his other draconian proposals under National Security Memorandum Number 200. Would food be considered an instrument of national power? Is the U.S. prepared to accept food rationing 
to help people who can't, won't control their population growth. Family planning performance and population control should be taken into account for appraisal of assistance requirements by USAID, meaning that the degree to which they reduce their population numbers should account for how much food aid they're gonna receive. That's a starvation food as a weapon policy. It's absolutely disgusting, but unfortunately, it's nothing new. It's something Bertrand Russell, the English mathematician and supposed genius, came up with back in the earlier part of the 20th century when he proposed what amounts to an international food authority to, quote, deal with this problem of increasing population and decreasing food supplies, the old Malthusian formula, and saying it will be necessary to find ways of preventing an increase in world population. If this is to be done other than by wars, pestilence, and famines, it will demand a powerful international authority. This authority should deal out the world's food to the various nations in proportion to their population. If any nation subsequently increases its population, it should not on that account receive any more food blackmail by starvation for overpopulation. Therefore, the motive for not increasing population would be very compelling. That's from 1953, the impact of science on society. But those exact same proposals, or very similar proposals, came out in 1977, again, in Ecoscience written by Holdren and Ehrlich. They said perhaps those agencies, combined with the United Nations and UNEP population agencies, might eventually be developed into a planetary regime of an international super agency for population resources and environment. Such a comprehensive planetary regime could control the development, administration, conservation, and distribution of all natural resources, including all food on the international market. The planetary regime might be given responsibility for determining the optimum population for the world and for each region and for arbitrating various countries' shares within their regional limits. Again, they're gonna create a global superstructure that will gather all the food and then ration it to the countries, holding it over the heads of those that are overpopulated and underdeveloped until they curb their own population to meet the given food rationing. That is absolute tyranny, but that is the kind of direction we're heading under the population control management system of this modern day eugenic system under the new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, they have put fluoride in our water for almost the better part of 50, 60 years, maybe even longer in some areas. They have proposed putting lithium and other drugs in our water to mass medicate people against their will. They have created genetically modified crops, which experts like Jeffrey Smith say cause sterility in the third generation in lab rats. Now what happens if they feed Africa or other parts of the developing world genetically modified crops against their will or without their knowledge or through an international food agency and it doesn't even occur to them until 60 years down the line that everyone's sterilized from eating this food? It's outrageous, but the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation are part of the very companies pushing for the new green revolution through genetically modified foods in Africa as we speak, and the exact same foundations are behind the global initiative to vaccinate everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, these population control measures and so many others we didn't have time to get to tonight present a children of men scenario. We're gonna wind up unable to reproduce anymore someday. They've written about this 80, 100 years ago, how they don't want people to be able to reproduce at will anymore, only with state authority, and how they're gonna use artificial fertility to sell the ability to have babies at a premium. It's all covered in Endgame and other resources we've brought up on the show. If you haven't seen this incredible production, it covers the whole spectrum of the official eugenics movement all the way down the line to the DNA database-based race-specific bio-weapons that they may use against us in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the end game times, and if we don't face the facts, we're gonna see a winter, a demographic winter, on life as we know it, the societies we've enjoyed. You've seen the Georgia Guidestones, 
calling for humanity to be under 500 million. You've seen all the other elites calling for a population under 2 billion or under 1 billion. They want a mass extermination and they are perfectly ready to get ready, rid of the masses as we enter the next phase of the technological revolution. And as the New World Order state attempts to take full power in the Republic, in our personal independence, and attack the family and individual. I'm Aaron Dykes. We'll be back with more special Infowars.com reports in the future. Thanks for joining us.